Feeling in my bones, you're about to move. I feel it in the wind, you're about to ride it. You said that you were pouring your spirit out. You said that you would fall on sons and daughters. So.
Good evening, church. Jake here. How good was worship? I love our praise and worship. It is now that special time of the service. We're going to come to a time of offering and communion. So if you want to go get your emblems, I would love to get started. So 1 Samuel chapters 1 and 2. Now, this seems like a lot to read, but don't. It's okay. I'm going to give you a bit of a preview. So the story follows Elkanah, who has two wives, Penina and Hannah. He has 10 sons with Penina and zero sons with Hannah. Now in society, that probably wouldn't have been fantastic for Hannah and especially with the competition of being two wives. Penina was actually quite mean to Hannah. Uh, every, every year they'd go up to the tabernacle in Shiloh and they would give their offerings for the year of blessing. And Elkanah would give two portions, one each wife and then a portion of meat to every son to give over and every year this would end in distress this would end in ridicule this would end in so much agony from Panina to Hannah Panina was so mean and rubbing it in that did not have a kid and could not bring anything to Elkanah in that time so the story reads that one year Hannah was so sick of this ridicule of being childless that she runs out of the temple and meets Eli at the front and she prays this incredible prayer and says, Lord, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you as your own. And you know, he eventually falls pregnant very, very soon after that prayer. And we now know that son to be Samuel, the great prophet in the Bible. I love reading about Samuel and his life. Now, but I can't help but think, Hannah had a need and it was so agonizing and it brought her to tears she refused to eat it was giving so much physical and emotional pain but the solution to her problem was actually quite natural she wanted a kid she got pregnant Panina had 10 of them you know there was nothing special about Samuel when he was born he wasn't born with a gold band around his wrist he wasn't born to a certain amount of wealth he didn't have the amazing long hair that a gold standard had he was actually just a normal kid so I can't imagine that would have given Panina too much closure because she had nine more. Like it was, it was nothing about that. But what I what inspires me is in chapter two, where Hannah praises the Lord and prayers, says this: "My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Now I have an answer for my enemies. I rejoice because you rescued me. No one is holy like the Lord." There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Now, now I have an answer for my enemies. That is quite inspiring because the answer was quite normal, to be honest. You know, I work at Woolworths at the moment, as I've told you guys before, and um, I'm kind of getting over it. I'm ready for a new season. You know, a little frustrating enough pray with God a few times, Lord, give me some more opportunities. God, give me somewhere more to my strength. Give me somewhere that I'll be happier. And thankfully, I'm so proud to announce that I had a job interview, which is going really well. And I've progressed to the end and we're finding placements. But when I think about my solution, it's actually quite normal. Everyone quits. Everyone gets sick of their job and everyone gets a new job interview. Everyone gets a new job. The actual job interview isn't that special but when I compare myself to my friends I know that the job that I'm walking into and the job interview that I had is God ordained it is going into my future is going into my ministry it's something that God has called me into and it is so incredible and the solution isn't just a job interview but it's a God job interview and it changes myself you know just like Hannah the solution wasn't all incredible but God changed her God changed me and God changes us to overcome the situation. He doesn't just do it for us. So when it comes to a time of communion, I'm not surprised that the bread and the wine are for us. You know, the bread is healing for our bodies. The blood cleanses our sin. We don't just give the wine to our problems. We don't give the bread to my boss. We give it to us and God changes us for the solution church I don't know if you guys have a need at the moment but when we take communion I don't want to just take it for a snack 
I want to say, Lord, empower me. Be with me. Change me. Help me ride your solution. And we can overcome this together. So church, why don't we partake and say, Lord, change us. Help us and be with us. Lord, I thank you that you're a good God. I thank you that you're a God that wants to help. That you're a relational God. And Father, I pray over my future issues and my current issues, Father. I pray for everyone else, Father. I pray that you don't just give just a natural solution, but God, you change us to be the super, to add to your natural. Lord, you do through us what only you can do, that we can overcome the issues that we face. Lord, we thank you and we partner with you in that. Amen. At church, we're going to come to a time of offering. I want to thank everyone who's already given. The options will appear on the screen. I want to jump back into the story of Hannah. So it says further in the story that Hannah has the kid named Samuel. And once Samuel's grown up a little bit more, he actually, she gives him to the church as she promised to God. She visits Eli and says, I don't know if you remember me, but this is the promised child that God has given me, I will give him to you and raise him in the church, raise him to be God's own. Now, I can't imagine how hard that would have been for Hannah. Now, giving the miracle son, the one that she had, the only shot at giving Elkanah something, and she freely gave him to the church, that is incredible so much agony so much pain she was been through so much torture that she went through over the years just to give Samuel back and I can't help but think the lifestyle differences Samuel would have had staying with Hannah being given to the church I have no doubt if he stayed with Hannah Hannah would have poured into him being the miracle child she would have given him all the money everything he needs the best of the best society would have said the miracle child, the one from Hannah, you know, the one. Elkanah would have treated him special. He was the one to the childless woman. He was special. He would have had a perfect life, wouldn't have to lift a finger. He would have the best of the best. However, you look at his life now. When you look at his life when he was at church, he became a great prophet. He traveled the world doing incredible things. He advanced the kingdom. He, you know, tore demons away. He saved people. He took on nations. He was an incredible man of God. And I can't help but think that he did better when starting in the church than if Hannah had kept him for himself. You know, when it comes to a time of offering, we've been given what we have by God. And some of us have slaved over it. Some of us have fought for it. Sometimes it is a miracle solution to a seamless need. And it's so hard to give up. But can I promise you, church, if you give like Hannah did, God is going to do so much more with what you've given and what you have than if you just kept it for yourself. If you've been given some financial blessing for praying over and fighting over. Can I encourage you? God's not done yet. He's got so much more for you. If you've got promises, if you've got gifts, if you've got needs, if you've got uh, prophecies that are yet to come, God's going to do so much more. You just got to give it. You just got to give it over through all the pain. Church, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for the people that are given. Thank you for those who are yet to give. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're a good God. We thank you that you are willing and wanting to do more with what we give you than what we keep. Father, I don't want to be a stingy person. I want to be a generous heart. I pray that through what we give you, you do what only you can do. Amen. Church, I'm so excited for the word. I'm so excited for what's going to happen and the breath of the week and I hope you join me uh, in the excitement of hearing the word this week.
Come on, let's go. Well, here we are, we're in lockdown. Some of us were hoping that we wouldn't be there. There's a few introverts that are like, yeah, I'm loving lockdown. There's a few extroverts that are driving their partners crazy. Big shout out to you as well. Uh, wherever you are in lockdown, first of all, thank you so much for tuning in. We love you. But also if there's anything that we can do to help you um, cope better with this in any way that's, that's possible for us, reach out. We'd love to be able to help you, even if it's just to pray for you. Hey, let's pray and get stuck into the word. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather around your word. I pray, Lord God, it would transform and change us as it always does in Jesus' name. Amen. Lockdown makes us think about some funny things, Shiloh. I don't know about you. So good for you to join us, by the way, whether you're a churchy and you're always tuned into church or if you're like a visitor, someone's just like, hey, I've never watched church before, but I think I'm going to watch this. Wherever you are, whoever you are, I got to tell you, there's one thing that we all have in common. That is lockdown makes us think about some funny things. Remember last year, everybody's craze was sourdough bread baking. Everybody wanted to bake sourdough and all these people were consumed by thoughts of sourdough. Um, when this recent lockdown happened, everyone was thinking, how long is it going to last? And da, 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 da. Some people were thinking that it wasn't real. Other people were thinking it was the end of the world, right? There was all kinds of aspects of thinking. Because there's one liner in the Bible, um, Proverbs in 23, 7, it says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So I was thinking about this scripture and then I started to think about my thinking as one does in lockdown. We think about strange things. I was thinking about what I'm thinking about. And I thought, what does my thought life say about who I am? Strange things, but that's what I was thinking as I was taking the rubbish outside for the only time of outside I could actually do. And um, I was thinking about all of this and uh, I stumbled across an account in scripture. I stumbled on an account in scripture of a woman in distress. She's got a health crisis in her family. She's locked in a house, as many of us are, and she's in need of a miracle. Now, normally when I read a story like this, I focus on the miracle. I focus on the prophet. I focus on the situation. I look at all of that kind of stuff. I preach about all that stuff. But this time, because I was thinking about thinking about thinking, <laughs> um, I actually focused on her thought life. I thought, what was she thinking throughout this passage of scripture? And while the Bible doesn't actually record her thoughts, what it does do is it hints at some perceptions that she had. The way we perceive things matters. Perception is reality in, in so many different ways. And I've preached about that before. I won't have time to go into that today. But I will say this, what we think about flows out into our life. It has a way of controlling what happens in our life. So she had two misperceptions. She had two kind of wrong thought ideas that play out in this story and make her do wild and wacky things, including blow up at the prophet. She just goes off at him. Um, but another thing that happens is she had two really great perceptions, two truthful, godly perceptions she had in her world. And she wasn't what I would have called the most godly person, but she had them and they played out and they caused great breakthrough to her. So I'm going to preach this story. It's a great story. It's about a guy called Elijah. Now we looked at Elisha a few weeks ago. This is Elisha's mentor, Elijah. Why did God put Elijah and Elijah so close together? I don't know. I can't wait to ask him that in heaven. It's kind of confusing. But Elijah, let's take a look at what happens to him when someone he cared about got ill and they blew up at him and he had to deal with that scenario, right? So if you've got a Bible, 1 Kings chapter 17, we're going to be reading from 17 to 24. 1 Kings 17, 17 to 24. If you've got a physical Bible, why don't you grab that? It's in the Old Testament. It's like the first third of the Bible. Uh, if you've got a digital Bible and you're watching it on your phone and you've got to like close this down to just, I'll put the scripture on the screen, just read it on the screen, right? First Kings 17, so chapter 17, verses 17 to 24. If you're going for a jog or whatever and you're just listening to me, I'll read it to you. This is what it says. Sometime later, the woman's son became sick. He grew worse and worse and he finally died. And then she said to Elijah, so her son's just died. This is what she says. Oh man of God, what have you done to me? Pause. So she's in her own mini lockdown, right? She's having a massive crisis, which is understandable. And it's cooked her thinking, which is also understandable. And as a result of that cooked thinking, it's produced her first misperception. She had a misperception about God. She had a misperception about God. And I'll explain why. If you're taking notes, number one, God often isn't what you think he is. God often isn't what you think he is. It's funny that a crisis usually has a way of challenging our understanding of God. She thinks that through God's representatives, Elijah, that God has done this terrible thing. And as in, it can't be undone. It's finished. It's locked in. It isn't going to change, right? God's finished with her and God's moved on, right? The son's dead. God's out of here. Which shows that she clearly doesn't understand God. And as funny as it sounds, some Christians can also develop some really strange views about God when they're going through a crisis. So allow me to settle her misperception and maybe some of your misperceptions. 
I'm going to read you one of my favorite promises of God in the Bible. I love this one. I love this book, actually, not just because of the name, but because of the promises in there. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. This scripture is going to be like silver bullet, bang, kill that misperception. Are you ready? It says, and I am certain, and I am certain, poor, certain. I think that word's important. Um, when Christian and I were first courting or dating, uh, I would have said I was certain that she loved me. But now that we've been together almost 18 years, I'm really certain. There's a different kind of certainty, right? There's like, yeah, I'm certain that this is going to be a good day. And there's like, I'm certain, certain. Like I know what happened yesterday. Like I know my favorite kind of ice cream. Like I know my favorite TV show. Like I'm certain, certain. Some translations say confident, same thing. And I am certain that God who began a good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. That God who began a good work in you will continue his work until it's finally finished. So in the Western world, we totally misuse the word good. How, how was that movie that you saw the other night? Oh, it was good. What did you think about the hamburger that you ordered on Uber Eats? It was good. Um, but God doesn't use good the same way. If you look at the Genesis account of creation, Genesis chapter one, right? God uses the word good on repeat. Uh, he uses the word good to describe the water lapping on the shore on a beach. He uses the word good to describe lush green grass and beautiful uh, trees. He uses the words good to describe things like birds uh, in the sky like eagles. So if you think about, and I know that like uh, you might be lucky enough to be in one of those locations where you can do that, it's in your 10 kilometer radius. Think about Queensland has some of the most exquisite beaches in the world. White sand, turquoise water, 32 degrees outside, crystal clear blue skies. And if you just close your eyes for a second and imagine the water lapping on the shore, God uses the word good to describe that. Or maybe if you've ever been into like a tropical rainforest, maybe even the hinterland, and you've come across one of those waterfalls where the water just roars as it rush down and hits the rock. And you look at the water and it's so fresh, you're like, I could drink this. Some of you would, and some of you would be like, who's peed in there? I don't want to drink that. But anyway, the scene is just pristine. And you're like, oh my gosh. You know the word that God uses to describe that? Good. Or what about a sunset? Have you ever had one of those sunsets where you've tried to take a photo of it because it's so majestic and yet the photo didn't do it justice? So you put it on Instagram and you want people to be like, oh my gosh, that's the best sunset ever. But it, the, it just didn't capture how incredible it is. Is this the most incredible sunset? You know what God uses to describe that? Good. And then he uses the same word to describe his work in your life. He says, what I'm doing in your life today is good. I'm doing a good work in your life. Um, and this is where, sadly, even so many Christians get undone. This is the thing you've got to understand. God does not need to fix every mess around the whole world to complete a good work in you. Stop tethering your belief in God's goodness over your life to what's happening in the mess that is our society right now. Everybody's journey is their own. Your journey is not linked to somebody else's journey when it comes to the goodness of God, right? The goodness of God in your life is not depend on, dependent on what happens this year with Donald Trump post-election. The goodness of God is not dependent on what he's doing in Bill Gates' life and what he may or may not be involved with behind the scenes. The goodness of God is not dependent on Scott Morrison and how he does or doesn't run the country. The goodness of God is not dependent on what your neighbor cooks for dinner tomorrow night. The goodness of God is not dependent on anybody else because it is the goodness of God, not the goodness of other people, right? And at this particular time in history, in 1 Kings chapter 17, there was a drought going on. The drought had caused a food shortage. There would have been panic buying and all kinds of stuff going on at that point in time. But you don't hear her say, oh, well, oh God, I know the world's a mess right now. And so I probably can't expect anything good. But you know, if you could maybe, and she doesn't talk like that. As muddled up as she is, as had misperceptions as she has, as misunderstood uh, as God was in this story to her, she still understood that her ability to experience goodness was directly connected to God and not was actually happening around her. This is a revelation that we need to get. The same is true for us. We can lay hold of the promises of God, like Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 that I just read before, regardless of what's happening outside your home. Your political candidate does not need to win the election if your breakthrough is coming from God and not the candidate. Hello, your LGA does not need to record no active cases for 90 days for your family to be blessed if the 
blessing of, comes from God and not from your LGA, right? Your bank account does not need to hit a certain level for you to be financially blessed if your finances and your provision is coming from God and not your bank account, right? What do you believe about God? What do you believe about God's goodness? Do you believe that God is actually in charge and sovereign over the universe? Do you believe that your blessing is dependent on other people or do you believe that your blessing is dependent on Him? Who is God to you, right? That's why I said God is often not what you think He is because quite often we think that God is somebody who has to deal with everybody else first and iron everybody else's thing out before He does something for us. I remember, this will come as a shock to some of you who wouldn't let me use power tools on the I Love My Church days. Next one's coming up soon. Um, I actually worked as a builder's laborer for a few months when I was younger. I helped build a house and uh, I wasn't very good at it, to be fair. Um, although the house looks pretty fantastic today. It hasn't fallen over. Yay. Um, uh, big shout out to Sermon last week. Um, uh, but I did learn a lot about God and I learned a lot about building in this process, right? I have an appreciation for all the tradies. When you build a slab, which is the, 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 the concrete that everything else lands on top of. I remember building the slab. That was, that was hard yakka. I remember staring at the slab when it was finished and dried and walking on it and thinking, man, this looks good. And it was an awesome looking slab. The builder was happy, I was happy. But I didn't go, oh, this is stupid. Where's the frame? This is a dumb house. Where's the roof? This is stupid. The brickies haven't even turned up yet because it wasn't finished yet. I looked at it and I said, this is a good slab. Now, yes, if a thunderstorm hit, I wouldn't be there in the slab. I'd go and find shelter. But, but I didn't write off the whole project just because it wasn't finished. I remember we built the frames. The builder didn't buy them. We built them, right? And so we built the frames. I remember we put the frames up. I was like, man, this is good. This is so good. It looked amazing. I was so proud of the work that we did. But I didn't say, well, this is stupid. It's a stupid bunch of frames because there's no roof on it. And if it rains, I'm going to get drenched. I understood that there was a process actually happening, right? That we weren't finished yet, right? And you've got to understand something. God is building your life. And it is not completed yet, but it will get completed, right? God is a tireless worker. He doesn't take RDOs. He doesn't have annual leave. He wasn't planning on sipping pina coladas on the beach during the Eco holiday. So it didn't freak him out that the date got changed, right? He was going to work that day anyway. God, here's a news flash for you. God's not stuck in lockdown. God is not restricted to his home. God can go anywhere he likes, right? And as a result of that, you've got to know something that God is building a good work in you. And yes, it's not completed, but it will finally get completed on the day of his return. And yes, you might only have the slab and the frame and other stuff is missing, but that doesn't mean that it's not good and that God isn't going to finish it. You know, the builder that I was working for, the master builder, he wasn't some kind of nutcase that would come up to me and go, well, that part of the frame looks bad and then just take a sledgehammer to it. That's a psychopath would do that. He wasn't a psychopath. And here's the thought, God's not a psychopath either. So when he sees mistakes that you've made, when he sees things that you've done, some of which might even be 20 years old, he doesn't take a sledgehammer to your life to say, well, I'll never make that. He doesn't need to do that. He can just point it out and say, that wasn't good. We've got to work on that. That's what my builder would say. Oh, that, that's, this is a measure up. That's not good. We're going to need to do it like this. He can go nuts. What does that do? God is not crazy. God does not take sledgehammers to your work, but God is doing something good. God has moved on from some of those mistakes that you made 20 years ago, and you need to move on too. He's let go and you need to let go, which kind of brings me to my next point. Let's see if you can pick up her misperception. It goes on and she says, have you come here to point out my sins and kill my son? That's what she says. Just goes off, right? Her next misperception was about sin. Number two, everyone say number two, type number two into the chat or number two in the comments or if you're vacuuming your floor, yell out number two. Your kids will think you're crazy. It's fantastic. Number two, sin is isn't always what you think it is. Sin isn't always what you think it is. She had a misperception about sin, right? She isn't even the only one. Um, I think this is one of the most common misperceptions that people actually have when they go through a crisis. Now we somehow think because of what we've done and sometimes a million years ago is causing this problem that we're in right now. It's causing lockdown, it's causing the business to fail, it's causing the family to go through strife, it's causing some other thing. Actually, when I pray for people who are sick, particularly if it's, it's cancer or something quite serious, this often comes up. Well, uh, you know, I need to confess, this is what happened, this is what happened. Um, people talk about their past and maybe that's the reason why. I've got to understand why this is happening. And it seems pretty logical until you encounter this little gold nugget. 1 John 1, 9, 1 John 1, 9. Let me read it to you. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins 
and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God for his grace. He wipes away our sin. And I know someone's going to say, what about consequences? I'll talk about them in a second, right? But consequences to sin and the grace of God have to be held in balance, right? If you just talk about consequences without grace, you won't understand consequences. And if you just talk about grace without consequences, you won't understand consequences. You've got to, you've got to be able to balance them both, right? So when your life comes under fire, your response does not have to be based on sin if you understand this scripture, right? Yeah, but Phil, what about my fast? Yeah, yeah, I get your past, but what about God's grace? He is faithful and just to forgive you from, cleanse you from all sins. That's every single sin. Not just the recent ones, but all the really bad ones that you've done that you still feel guilty about, right? And it's usually not a case of consequence when we talk about past sins, because quite often, not always, but quite often we have already dealt with those consequences. We've already experienced those consequences. But we end up like some crazy conspiracy nut on YouTube linking things that aren't actually linked. Oh, well, I think that this happened last week and that was because I did this thing 20 years ago. Well, I think this is happening in my relationship now because like 19 relationships ago in 1976 when I was in year 10, I did this, right? We've actually got to learn to, to, to um, see things through the lens of the way God sees them. And when God has cleansed you from all sin and unrighteousness and you've dealt with consequences, don't look for ways to connect things that don't need to be connected. God has moved on. You need to move on too, right? Which means God has forgiven you. And so you need to forgive yourself. Maybe you even need to look in the mirror of this lockdown every day, start a new habit and say, I forgive you for what you did, right? We need to forgive others, yes, but we also need to forgive ourselves. And I know you think, yeah, but for why does that matter? Well, I, I deserve to hold on to this guilt. I deserve to not forgive myself. It matters because misperceptions produce false expectations. What do I mean by that? Well, we tend to blame ourselves. We tend to hate on ourselves. We tend to speak it over ourselves. And then we begin to believe it. Because remember what I said before, as he thinks in his heart, so easy. So once we believe it, and we make mistakes, we go, well, yeah, well, that's because I'm messed up. That's because I'm a divorcee. That's because I'm a this. I and mean, that's because I'm, a, you know, a bad businessman. That's because I'm a whatever, right? And then as a result, when we interact with other people, we have the expectation that they're going to see the flaws in us that don't actually exist because God has already cleansed you from that sin and unrighteousness. And so we recoil from people, we recoil from God, and it just ends up becoming a giant mess. Do you know how you untangle that knot? You start by forgiving yourself. Have an accurate perception about sin. Forgive yourself. Also, though, we need to forgive others. You know, uh, why would you want to avoid that this lockdown? Life's miserable enough as it is. Let it go, right? Isn't this a good time to let things go? Maybe pick up the phone and call the person or have a Zoom chat. Break the ice. What else are you going to do in lockdown? Why not take some good out of it, right? Maybe put that person back on your Christmas card list if you're writing that out in lockdown. Um, it's interesting, they did some psych studies on unforgiveness that I was reading, which is really fascinating. And they were showing us that unforgiveness psychologically actually wears you out. Holding on to hurt actually hurts you. In fact, forgiveness is really interesting. The studies that I read suggested that if we practiced acts of forgiveness as they referred to it, not only is it tied to mental health breakthroughs, it's even tied to physical health breakthroughs. In other words, unforgiveness can make you physically sick. That's crazy, right? Which means um, even things like blood pressure levels can be affected by unforgiveness. So here's a thought. Forgiving others of their sin is actually beneficial for you and holding it against them actually hurts you. So let the sin go. It doesn't excuse it. It just makes it God's problem, not yours. And you've got enough problems. You don't need any more. Let it go, right? He paid for it on the cross, so we need to forgive it for ourselves. He paid for it on the cross, so we need to forgive other people. We need to learn to trust other people. And this is where the story takes a bit of a turn, right? So there are four misperceptions. Oh, sorry, four perceptions. Two of them misperceptions and two are good godly perceptions, right? So we're seeing the two bad ones. Let's look at the two good ones. And this is really important because it goes to show that no matter how you started lockdown, maybe you started lockdown and it's just not going well. If you can learn to get some good thinking into your little head, God can turn your lockdown around so that you exit it much better than the way you went into it. Hallelujah. Verse 19. But Elijah replied, give me your son. And he took the child's body from her arms, carried him up the stairs to the room where he was staying, and he laid the body on his bed. Then Elijah cried out to the Lord, Oh Lord, my God, why have you brought tragedy on this widow who has opened up a home to me, causing her son to die? And he stretched himself out over the child three times. And he cried out to the Lord, Oh Lord, my God, please let this child's life return to him. 
the Lord heard Elijah's prayer and the life of the child returned and he revived. Pause. So that she had two truthful perceptions. The first one, which saved her son's life was, and if you're writing this down, trust is a choice, not a skill. Trust is a choice, not a skill. That sounds a bit odd, but think about it. So God speaks through many different ways, but in this case, he spoke through the prophet Elijah. And as hard as it would have been for her to give over her son, who she was obviously attached to, it's her son, and she's just died, she did it. She didn't have to, but she chose to. Which means you might have done everything wrong in your life, but if you choose to trust God, he will change you, mold you, and make you into something incredible. So if you're in the middle of a mess, you need to choose to trust God. That, that's kind of what she did, right? And I say choose and not learn because trust is not a skill. You either trust or you don't. She either hands over the boy or she doesn't. She either trusts that God is going to do something or she does not. She does not have time to, oh, well, you've got to understand, Elijah, I'm just going to learn the skill of trusting God and trusting you over the next six to 12 months. She didn't have a chance. She either chose to trust God or she didn't, right? And we either, we either need to trust God or we don't. Now, what's God calling you to do this lockdown? What's God speaking to you about this lockdown? What goals is God challenging you on this lockdown? What is he saying that you need to try when you get out of lockdown? My follow-up question to that is this, do you actually trust him? Like if he's asking you to take a step of faith in your business, do you trust him? If he's asking you to break up with that person because you know and God knows that you're better than that, uh, do you trust him? Um, if he's trusting you to make a pivot in your career or make some changes in your family, do you trust him? This is usually where people are like, yeah, of course I trust God. Like particularly church people. Oh, oh, oh. Um, but this is the simplest way to check if you actually trust God, right? You want to know? It's pretty simple. Did you do what he said? <laughs> like when he said, hand me over the boy, she did it. <laughs> There's the proof that she trusted. Well, I feel I don't know about her thinking. Oh, I can tell you she trusted because she handed the child over. If she didn't, she wouldn't, right? So here's a thought. Do you do what God says? Take a leap of faith if you haven't and trust him, right? What have you got to lose? That world's a mess anyway. A little bit more wouldn't hurt, right? Trust God. See what he does. I guarantee it won't be a mess, right? And I know what you're going to say. Trust is easier said than done. I agree it is, right? And we see that here. Because not only does his son's body lay there lifeless, there's no word from the Lord. At no point in Scripture does God explain himself. There's no explanation for the boy's illness. There's no authoritative word on how this event figures into God's master plan. This unexpected turn of events leaves both the Elijah and the widow searching for an explanation. Elijah's upstairs going, I don't know what's going on, God. You've got to fix this. The widow's like, I don't know what's going on. You've got to fix this, right? But in a moment of crisis, when she did not have all the answers, when she didn't have a video explaining what to do, right? Her response was to trust God and trust Elijah's words, who God was speaking through, right? And then what God does is he mobilizes the power of life and death. Now, we gloss over that. This was huge in 1 Kings 17. We gloss over that because we've seen Lazarus raised from the dead. We've seen Jesus raised from the dead. We've heard about all these other miracles around the world. By the time 2 Kings 17 was happening, God had not raised anyone from the dead in the earth that the Bible records. So she was asking God to do something that he had never done before. And he did it partly in response to her trust, right? She needed to trust God. Look, I've had a wonderful life with Krista, but none of that wouldn't happen if I didn't propose. <laughs> I have loved getting to know all of you at Shiloh. It's been fantastic, but none of that would have happened if I didn't say yes to moving here. Both of these moves were led by the Lord and both of them were scary at the time, but I chose to trust God. And the trust was challenging at first, but look how wonderfully both of those things have panned out, right? I understand that trust is not easy, but it is a choice, not a skill. Verse 23. Then Elijah brought him down from the upper room and gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son is alive. And then the woman told Elijah, now I know for sure that you're the man of God and that the Lord truly speaks through you. <laughs> Story ends with proof of her second and last truthful perception. Comfort zones are like swimming pools. Comfort zones are like swimming pools. What do I mean by that? Well, comfort zones are like swimming pools. They're great for rest, um, but they're not where you should spend time in a crisis. <laughs> if there was... Um, a war that broke out, I would suggest not a good time to put on your bathers and go for a swim, right? Uh, there are swim pools are great, but they're not a good place for a crisis. And this is, let me unpack this for you. The Old Testament is a bit different to today. Today, we've got all these great men and women of God who are walking around, people like Joyce Meyer, who I love, and Pastor Russell Evans, and you know, all these great men and women of God. 
but in that period of time, although there were godly men and women, as far as like God's spokespeople go, he generally only picked one person at a time. The whole world has one spokesperson, right? So for her to have the boldness or the guts to come up to him and have a go at him like that, use that sarcasm and that venom in her voice, whew, it, even if she was right or wrong, it does not matter just for, for, the, for the purpose of this point because it's proving her thinking, right? We're not judging her thinking. I'm explaining her thinking. Um, it doesn't actually matter if she was right or wrong. What it proved is that she was willing to step outside her comfort zone. It would not have been comfortable for her to challenge the only spokesperson God had on the earth. Now, I know what you're going to say. Oh, yeah, but Phil, she was desperate for her son to live. To which I respond, how desperate are you for the Holy Spirit to move in your life? If you're desperate for God to move, you will step outside your comfort zone. And if not, I guess not, right? And that's where it gets interesting. Do you know some scholars actually believe that this particular little boy was Jonah? He grew up to be the great prophet of God. The book of Jonah was written um, where he started a revival in the city of Nineveh, which is located in present-day Iraq for all the geography buffs. So this single mother stepping out of her comfort zone may not just have saved her son's life, but an entire city and caused an entire book of the Bible to be written. And I know that it ended really well. But it wouldn't have ended well if she didn't step outside her comfort zone because she understood that comfort zones are like swimming pools. She almost lost it all. The wheels almost fell off the wagon. Yes, she had a wrong perception about God. She did, clearly didn't understand God's goodness. She didn't understand his ways. And yes, she had a wrong perception about sin. She held on to sin that God had probably let go of a long time before. Yes, she needed to forgive herself. Yes, she needed to let go of the past, right? But she did do some good things. As a person thinks in their heart, huh? Um, she, she thought it wise to trust God. She was right on that. Yes, it was tough. Yes, it took tremendous faith. Yes, it involved trusting you know, God wrapped up in the messenger in this instance of Elijah. Yes, trust is easier said than done. But ultimately, she, she did that. She had the guts to step outside the swimming pool, to step outside of her comfort zone. It's like that old saying, no guts, no glory, right? She had the guts to do that, right? And in, many in her society would have said that she had no right to even speak to the prophet, let alone challenge him like that. But she did that. And it, it's interesting, God's surprising willingness to do something he'd never done before in history is out of response to these two good things, which means I don't know how you find yourself in lockdown. Maybe you're in need of a miracle right now. Maybe you just need a, a miracle just like, I can't, I can't, I can't do any more, many more days of this. I don't know if I can get through today, let alone tomorrow. Whatever that might be, right? You've got to understand that God is good and he does good things. He isn't finished doing good things. Maybe your house is just at the slab stage or the frame stage or they're just putting up the walls and you, you just feel disillusioned and disappointed. Hang in there. God is going to finish the home, right? God isn't taking a break during this lockdown. He's working in your midst, right? In your home. He's ready to move in your life right now as much as he ever has been. And yes, you might have sinned. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all done that. Let's be real, right? Others in your life might have sinned, okay? But God's forgiveness has paved a way to cover all of that in the blood of the Lamb. And God is not, uh, God's goodness is not tied to their sin or their unfaithfulness or the mess of the world. God wants to deal with you as an individual, right? He wants to forgive you. And, and so you've got to learn to embrace the truth that trusting God, no matter how hard it is, is a choice. It's not a skill that you can work on for the next six months. Although the more you do it, the easier that choice becomes. You do actually just need to trust God. And on the other side of that is some amazing things. And yes, between you and that other side is this thing called a comfort zone. And you've got to walk through it and then get out of it again, right? You've got to get out of that swimming pool. It's good for a swim. Don't want to do that in a crisis. If there's an earthquake, right? and the ground is being ripped open, don't want to be in a swimming pool, right? Um, you've, you, you've got to step outside your comfort zone. On the other side of that comfort zone is a great miracle, right? So take a leap of faith. If not now in lockdown, then when? Oh, well, Phil, I'm just going to wait till I'm not afraid. That's never going to happen. We're always going to wrestle with that. So just step out anyway. Be bold anyway. I'm sure she was quaking in her boots when she was angry. You know, um, she took a lot of guts to do that. But God moved in a situation regardless. Um, I'm going to pray for people right now. I'm going to pray for uh, two kinds of people. The first group of people I want to pray for is people who need Jesus because <laughs> it starts out of a relationship with him. And the second group of people I want to pray for is people who need to shift their thinking in this lockdown phase so that you come out better, stronger, more capable and more able to receive the miraculous power of God. But it all starts with Jesus Christ. God did the miracle. Not Elijah, not the woman, not her thinking. 
God did a miracle. Although there were pieces involved in the story and God uses natural things, ultimately he is the one who raised the boy to life. If you have dead things in your life, maybe a business, maybe a home finances, maybe a relational issue, maybe some other thing, and you need God to raise it back to life, it's God that does that. And that happens through relationship. It's interesting, he responded to the woman's need, but he listened to the voice of Elijah because he was in relationship with Elijah. God listens to the voice of his people. I'm not asking if you're religious. I'm not asking what you filled out on this recent census. I'm not asking any of that. What I'm saying is, is Jesus Christ Lord, which means he's in charge, and Savior, which means he's forgiven you for everything you've ever done. Is he Lord and Savior of your life? If he is, awesome. If he isn't, here's your opportunity to do something about that. Either for the first time, or if you're honest, you've kind of done that, but you've walked away and you need to come back, even if it's a hundredth time. I don't even need to be there. You don't even do anything weird. I'll just pray and you repeat the prayer after me because it's actually between you and God. It's not to do with me. And at the end of that prayer, you're going to be a Christian. Everything I preach today will be true for you and true for your life. Are you ready? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, please come into my life as Lord and Savior. Help me to follow you all my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, hallelujah. Hand clap, shouting emoji, doing my best Elaine dance, all that stuff, because you just made the best decision ever. Super happy for you. This is incredible. Hey, if there's anything we can do to help you in that journey, we'd love to hear it. Just inbox us. Let us know you made that decision. If we can send you some stuff or pray with you over the phone or whatever, we'd love to do that. Hey, just before I wrap up, I just want to pray for people that are like, just God can shift their thinking. And you, may be, you might be like, man, I just feel stirring in my heart. I need my thinking shifted. I don't even know what parts of my thinking though. I believe that God can use this lockdown experience just to readjust, just to kind of give you a car a service, so to speak, fine tune some things. So come on, if that's you, just stretch your hands towards the screen, hold your phone in your hand, whatever you might do just to say to God, hey, that's me. Dear Jesus, I just pray right now that you help to stir, shift and change people's thinking so it reflects your thinking, Lord God. And like this woman, it produces good things, not negative things, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would deal with misperceptions and you would shift and, and change them to truthful, godly, good perceptions in Jesus name. Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in Shiloh. It's great seeing you online, tuning into church. It's awesome that you've made that a priority. Um, if there's anything that we can do to help you in this time, reach out to us, shoot us a message, inbox us or whatever. We'll do what we can. We love you church. We're believing for great things in your world. God bless you. Bye-bye.